Hello again. So this is the third part of my introduction to the immune system and vaccination. I hope I haven't confused you all too much with all the different cells of the immune system so far. I was hoping that that would be a relatively accessible background as to how our immune system works and the fact that we do have those two main parts to it, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. In this part, we're going to be thinking a lot about vaccination. And the important thing really to think about with vaccination is our innate immune system we can't change. Our innate immune system, we're born with it and it's fully functional when we're born with it. It's our adaptive immune system, which depending on the pathogens we come into contact with, will change and also will remember. And so this is really important because essentially, when we're thinking about vaccination, what we're trying to do is trick our immune system. We're trying to make our immune system think it's come into contact with a pathogen that could be dangerous. And so all those adaptive cells, so your antibody present producing B cells, your T helper cells and your cytotoxic T cells, they will all produce large numbers and lots of memory cells. So then if you actually come into contact with the pathogen, you'll have that very strong response because you can skip out all the early bits, essentially, where they have to be activated by the antigen presenting cells and all of this. And hopefully then you'll have a strong enough response that you won't get unwell, or if you do, it will only be very, very mild symptoms. So again, just to show us where we are on our little immunological journey, um, we're here on part three, which is the vaccination part. And the description for that does say mainly me swooning over Edward Jenner and how amazing he was. I genuinely do believe that um, had I been born quite a few hundred years earlier, I would have been his wife. Um, and luckily, he's not here to contest that. So I think that's OK. Um, but I honestly think that Edward Jenner is the most amazing scientist in the world um, and in history. And I genuinely believe that his elucidation, his understanding and demonstration of how vaccination worked and works has saved more lives than any other scientist in history and probably more than any other scientist ever will be able to. So just a yeah, bit of a bold statement, but I genuinely believe that's true. So we'll talk about vaccination now and then in the next part, the last part, we'll talk a bit about pathogens, so different pathogens, and also some of the problems that we have when we come to have to come to try to produce vaccination. Again, this is just to remind you about the main differences between the cells. So just to reiterate, to remind you that the innate cells aren't really involved. They're not involved in vaccination because we can't do anything about them. They will react however they're going to be, however they're going to react. It doesn't matter how many times you come into contact with a pathogen or an antigen, those innate cells will respond in the exact same way. It's the adaptive cells which are involved with regards to vaccination. And that's because, as we've said, they will remember. So once you've come into contact with something foreign, so a pathogen, for example, Yes, the response might be quite slow and it might not be particularly aggressive that time round. But if you come into contact with the same pathogen again, because you've got those memory cells, essentially your immune system, your adaptive immune system will remember and it will be a very, very aggressive response. And we'll go through this on the next slide. So this is essentially what I've been talking about with regards to your adaptive immune system being able to remember. And we call them the primary and secondary responses. So as you can see on this graph along the bottom, we've got time. And you can see that primary immune response with the amount of antibody that's produced and the amount of time it takes. It takes quite a while to get the maximum antibody response, but actually, that's not a particularly large antibody response. 
So it's quite slow and it's not particularly aggressive. And that's because going back to last time, there's so many steps involved until you have B cells and enough B cells that can produce lots of antibodies. So it's slow and you won't necessarily have lots of B cells producing that specific antibody. However, after that infection's gone, you have all those memory cells and those plasma cells which can produce high levels of antibody very, very quickly. So on second exposure to the same antigen, you can see here towards the end of the graph, the response is much faster and it's much, much larger, which means generally you can essentially get rid of enough of that pathogen before you really become particularly unwell. And this is basically what Edward Jenner discovered. He didn't know this is what he was discovering, but this is what he discovered through observation looking at cows and cowpox. Um, and so this is on the next slide. This is where I'm going to get a bit excited about Edward Jenner. Um, I'm not going to apologise for that at all. As I said in the first part, um, I first visited Dr. Edward Jenner's house as part of my degree, my undergraduate degree in um, 2004. Um, I studied cancer biology and immunology and um, that's probably why I'm so interested in cancer and so passionate about the immune system. Um, and basically on the, on the right hand side of this slide, there's a picture of me. I was very young, looking, looking quite happy to be standing next to a picture of Edward Jenner. And for those of you who have visited Jenner's house or know anything about Edward Jenner's house, he was actually, um, I would say almost carrying out the work of the NHS back in the days when the NHS didn't exist. And this bottom picture is what we call his Temple of Vaccinia. And it's basically a small structure that he erected in his back garden where he would vaccinate people who couldn't afford the vaccination for free. So he was a nice guy. So you probably know the story of Edward Jenner, but I'm going to go through it anyway. So back in the late 1700s, um, smallpox was rife, not just throughout Britain, but throughout absolutely throughout the world. And it affected over 10% of the population and of the, ten, and of the population who did actually suffer from smallpox or contract it, around about 10% of them died. Those who didn't die tended to be horribly scarred and things like that. So you can see here, um, there's a quotation from a milkmaid of the time, uncredited, unfortunately. And she said, I shall never have smallpox, for I have had cowpox, so I shall never have an ugly pockmarked face. My gut feeling to that statement is, because you're not going to have smallpox, hopefully it means you're not going to die. And maybe a pockmarked face isn't actually the worst thing because you're not going to die. What Dr. Edward Jenner noticed as a rural doctor in Gloucestershire, Berkeley, was that milkmaids who were milking cows would develop pustules that looked like smallpox on their hands, but only had a very mild illness, and they seemed to be resistant from smallpox. And that's because what was happening was cows had cowpox, um, which is a virus caused by a virus very, very similar to the virus that causes smallpox. And what was happening was, without him fully understanding all the immunology behind it, what was happening was that the milkmaids were obviously catching the cowpox. Their adaptive immune system was showing off antigens of the cowpox to, um, well, to the immune system. So they were getting then antibody producing cells and other cells of the adaptive immune system specific for those antigens. But actually those antigens looked to the immune system to be the same as antigens 
that caused smallpox because the viruses looked so similar. And Edward Jenner didn't realise, he didn't know what antigens were and things like that, but he did recognise that this was a common, a common trend and thought to himself, this is worth investigating. And the way he did this would not have ethical, it would not have ethical approval now at all, but he actually paid his gardener to experiment on his gardener's eight-year-old son, a guy called, well, a child called James Phipps. And <coughs> he took some of the material from some cowpox blisters on a milkmaid called Sarah Nelms, um, which she believed was contracted from a cow named Blossom. And so he literally took some of that out of her own cowpox pustules and he injected it into little James Phipps. And there's reports that James had a reaction at the site where it was injected. It was, he was injected in both arms um, and that he did have a slight fever and he felt slightly unwell. But then subsequently, a while later, Dr. Jenner took some of the matter from someone's pustules of a patient with smallpox and injected that into James Phipps and there wasn't a response. And that's because essentially James's immune system was having then that aggressive secondary response because it thought that the smallpox essentially was the cowpox that he'd already come into contact with. So essentially, Dr. Edward Jenner exploited the adaptive immune response. Subsequently, following that, um, obviously science improved and we now know exactly how it works, but he started then vaccinating quite routinely and a lot of people, um, including still experimenting on his son when his son, his own son was only 11 months old. Um, and now we fully know that basically vaccines stimulate the production of antibodies and, and stimulate that primary response. And so then when you do come into contact with the dangerous pathogen, you'll have that secondary response and you should be protected or relatively protected from that pathogen. And the way that we do, we do this and we'll talk about this in the next part is basically they can be made in a number of ways. So often it will, the vaccines will contain dead or weakened parts of the pathogen. So the antigens present on the vaccine look to our immune system as though it's actually the live and dangerous pathogen, but it can't infect and it won't cause us to actually become unwell, um, but it will promote that primary immune response so that subsequently, if you do come into contact with that pathogen, you have the aggressive secondary response and you shouldn't become unwell. And the reason that we call it vaccination, this is just one of my fun facts, is because it comes from the Latin vacca, which means cow, um, which makes sense given that he derived the first vaccines for smallpox from having used matter from cowpox. So. So subsequently, following Dr. Jenner's discovery, as science progressed, we started to make more sophisticated versions of the smallpox vaccination and smallpox became the first infectious illness um, to be eradicated from the globe. And in 1980, the um, World Health Authority actually declared that the world was smallpox free. The last natural case of smallpox was reported in Somalia in 1977, which actually resulted in death. Um, but that wasn't the last case actually within the world because some of you may know of the story of Janet Parker. So Janet Parker worked at the University of Birmingham and they still had um, a stock of smallpox. And essentially there was an accident in the lab she contracted it and did unfortunately lose her life in 1978. So Janet Parker is the last known person to have died from smallpox, um, but the last naturalizing cases 
were reported in 1977. And now there haven't been any since 1980. So I just think that's absolutely fantastic. And that can be accredited to Dr. Jenner's discovery. So just thinking a little bit about certain examples of vaccinations, um, probably quite a few of you will have heard of the BCG, which is the TB vaccination. Um, TB is caused by um, a bacterium known as Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and it's an intracellular bacterium, so it actually will infect inside the cells, and it causes scarring and really quite prolific damage to the lungs. And as with smallpox before, high levels of sanitation, things like that, TB would kill a lot of people. And unfortunately, it still does in certain places in the world. And for the TB, the BCG vaccination, this actually contains live strains of a bacterium, but it's not TB. So this is very similar to what Edward Jenner did because he was using essentially a live strain, so live strain of cowpox, and then injecting that, and it was giving protection against smallpox. And that's very similar to how the, this TB vaccination works. So it's a live strain of a bacterium, but a bacterium that doesn't cause us any harm particularly. But our immune system misinterprets it, it sees those antigens, as if it was TB. So then when you come into contact with TB, you are protected from it. And again, this causes a nice big increase in antibodies that will be specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So for the bacterium that causes TB. And also there's evidence that it also produces high levels of other adaptive immune cells as well. So cytotoxic T cells and also your T helper cells. And because mycobacterium tuberculosis is an intracellular bacterium, it's important that you have those cytotoxic T cells because it means that then they can kill any cells which have become infected with the TB. Unfortunately, they seem to have stopped routinely vaccinating against TB in schools in the UK. And I don't want to get political, but um, there does seem to be an increase now in TB cases in the UK. So I think they should bring that back, if I'm honest. If we're thinking back to viruses, so smallpox is a virus, and we think a bit about the flu vaccinations which occur each year. And this we'll touch again on when we think about COVID-19 in the next part. So flu vaccinations are different each year. Probably most people know that flu vaccinations are different each year. And there's quite a few different types of flu. Influenza A and influenza B are the most prolific types. So they're the most common types. And basically, because of the nature of some viruses, they can kind of disguise themselves and they can change. So the way that they make up, especially the proteins inside them and the genetic material inside them can change. And that means that the antigens which are presented to your immune system are different depending on which strain of flu you actually contract and you're infected with. And so each year what they do is they basically take just the outside of the, of the flu virus itself. So anything inside that can actually cause infection and can cause damage to your cells isn't there. It's just the outside that contains the antigens, which is what the immune system sees. They find out which three types, so two from type A influenza, so influenza type A, and two from influenza type so one from influenza type B. And what they do is they produce a vaccine using those. So each year, if you have the flu vaccination, you should be protected against the most common types of flu that year. And it's been shown that what these, these flu vaccinations do is that they actually produce high levels of antibody. So if you remember when I said the scientific name for an antibody is immunoglobulin, and it's abbreviated to IG. So two of the types are IgG and IgA. 
And so it produces lots and lots of IgG and IgA. So B cells specific for those flu viruses, producing lots and lots of those specific antibodies. And as I said just here, basically it needs to be different each year because the virus can essentially, it changes its coat. So it puts on a disguise. It's still a virus that can infect you and give you those horrible flu-like symptoms. But unfortunately, the antigens look slightly different or look different enough to our immune system that you wouldn't necessarily be protected if the flu vaccination was the same every single year. So just thinking about has vaccination been able to cause the eradication of any other diseases? There is actually one other disease. It might surprise you that it's not more, um, but there's an infection called rinderpest. Now, this doesn't actually infect humans at all. Again, it's all about the cows. Um, this is actually a viral infection which affects cattle and it spreads very, very rapidly and um, it's very contagious contagious amongst the, amongst the cattle. And there have been reports where actually there's up to 100% mortality of whole herds of cattle who've actually been infected with with rinderpest and obviously that's incredibly bad for farmers and people who actually need or rely on cattle for their livelihood and also for sustenance. Um, but there has been a vaccine that's produced against rinderpest and actually they declared that it was eradicated from all cattle globally in 2011. So that's the only other example of a disease that's been declared to be eradicated worldwide except for smallpox as a consequence of vaccination. However, we are getting very, very close to the eradication of polio because of the polio vaccine. And polio is another viral infection and it causes some horrible defects in individuals because it prevents them being able to grow it often affects children and would cause problems with then their growth and development and in a lot of cases would actually kill children so that's not good but um, it was actually in the news just the other day there's been a new list where they've declared that there's actually a few countries especially in Africa where they've now stated that they're polio free zones and they believe that it's only still prevalent well not even prevalent but only still cases in places such as the so three places, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and also Nigeria. And overall, it's estimated that every single year, vaccination saves up to a million lives. Unfortunately, they do also think that globally, there must be over three million lives which are lost due to preventable diseases. So diseases where we do have vaccinations, but these are in quite often in places where unfortunately their healthcare system can't afford these vaccinations. So we definitely need to make sure that that's addressed in my mind. Um, so just here in the bottom right hand corner, you can see Dr. Jenner and that's him. It's a, a painting of him actually inoculating. So him giving that first vaccination to James Phipps. Um, that lady does seem to be holding on to the child really quite strongly. I'm not sure James Phipps was particularly keen, but if you know your history of Jenner's house, and you will do after this weekend, um, Edward Jenner actually left him a house. He left him quite a nice house as a thank you. Um, so I think that's quite good. So ultimately, just want to say thank you, Dr. Jenner. You really are absolutely my hero and millions and millions of other people as well. Um, you must be throughout history. And um, again, this is just my lovely smallpox is dead ruler that I did get from Jenna's house quite a long time ago now. So again, if you have any questions, just, just shout and let me know and um, I'm probably going to have to have a cup of tea to calm down a bit now after getting a bit excited about Edward Jenner again. Okay. Thank you.